and the power of cartoons. Yaakov is an artist in residence. He's a visiting fellow at ESA. He's connected to us permanently, and it's really an honor to have him. I remember in the early 1980s, living on a kibbutz, and the first thing that our group would do would be run to the law done to see the Jerusalem Post and look at Yaakov's uh, daily um, cartoon. So his work, as I'm sure most of you know, has been uh, very important. And uh, sort of Yaakov has become an icon in Israeli society. And I think in the Jewish diaspora, people connected to the Israeli media know Yaakov well. And uh, we think of him warmly and fondly. Um, Yaakov is originally from uh, New York. and. Uh, he is a graduate of Queens College. He has a degree in art. His publications have uh, gone throughout the world. He's, he was based in the Jerusalem Post for many years. But his uh, political and social commentary through his cartoons has, be, has been reprinted regularly in places such as Forbes magazine, the New York Times, the London, Sun, the London Sunday Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Guardian, Time magazine. The LA Times, the Associated Press, CBS, CNN, he was on CNN for an interview uh, a few months ago, and he's really known globally. He began drawing his daily editorial comic strip, given a raise the expectation of drawing, uh, uh, entitled Dry Bones in 1971, and he became well known for analyzing, satirizing, and commenting on, on the Jewish condition and Israeli politics, international relations, and current events. In 2008, Dry Bone celebrated his 31st year with the Jerusalem, 35th year with the Jerusalem Post. And Dry Bone is a regular feature of 40 newspapers just in North America alone. So it's really an honor to have Yaakov here. And uh, it was a pleasure, actually, I spent time in Israel during the summer uh, doing work for Yisa. And Yaakov was very helpful in, uh, in that work. So it's nice to see him here for the first time. Uh, even though he's been working on behalf of uh, ISA for months and uh, working with me uh, on these issues, which is a privilege. So, welcome. And, uh, oh, thanks. It's really an honor to be here on my uh, The way I got here is sort of bizarre, and that is uh, somebody had seen some cartoon uh, that was offensive. It was actually a cartoon that was. Uh, anti-Semitic cartoon directed against Christian Zionists. And uh, so somebody from some Jewish organization sent it to the head of another Jewish organization. And that email went to a third Jewish organization. And these people at Stand With Us, and Camera, and CRA, and American Jewish Congress, and they're writing these letters back and forth. What are we going to do about this cartoon? And then somebody writes, uh, well, Drybolt should do something about it. He's a cartoonist. Let him do something about it. Which is when I got this email package with all these emails back. And, then I, and you know how it is with emails. You're not smart enough to think it through. You get something and you just give them an answer. And it goes out and says, oh, why did I say that, Mike? And, uh, and one thing led to another, and a friend of mine put me in touch with some guy named Charles Small, who I didn't know from a hole in the wall, and he said, what would you do? And I wrote what I would do. And then he wrote back and said, I'd like to make you a fellow, which led me to think that he thought I was a girl. So that's, so that's when I discovered about Gisa uh, and the unbelievable thing that uh, Charles had started. It shouldn't be an, an unbelievable. You would think there would be something like Yissa at uh, every university in the free world, but then you'd be wrong. So I uh, came to America on uh, October 1st, as I explained to some of you, carrying illegal apples in my bag and was dragged off by the police in L.A. Uh, and what I've been doing is I've been going around the country uh, giving two, three speeches a day and basically talking about uh, YISA and about Zionist Organization of America and about CAMERA. Uh, ZOA and, uh, and CAMERA were the two Jewish organizations which were kept out of the administration's uh, discussions with the Jewish community, and that was good enough for me, so I 
contacted both organizations and, and said, uh, I want to do some work on your behalf. And so I came over, and then Charles discovered I was here. And he said, what do you mean you're here? And you're not coming to Yale? So here I am at Yale. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Dry Bones. I thought I'd just show you a quick thing about what I do and then get on to the business of the day. Uh, I'm a political cartoonist. Political cartoonists are the only people, the only journalists, who are allowed to lie, <laughs> right? No, it's true. A political cartoonist can uh, take the head of his country and put it in a cartoon and put words in his mouth that he never said, and that, that's, that's allowed. You know, I can say, I can put up a cartoon of B.B. and have him say, uh, I want to chase all the Arabs out of the country, right? If I was a columnist and I, and I wrote that, they would come back and say, he didn't say that, and he got a printer retraction. But if I do a cartoon saying that, well, that's fair game. As a cartoonist, I'm allowed hyperbole, I'm allowed exaggeration, I'm allowed to say, I'm reading his mind, this is what he really means. And therefore, when people do cartoons that are clearly anti-Semitic, you say, that's anti-Semitic. And the guy says, it's not anti-Semitic. You're just a right-wing supporter of Israel. And therefore, you're calling this anti This is hyperbole. And the question becomes, how do you know if something is anti-Semitic? How can you prove them? You know, what, how does this work? I'm a cartoonist, and I've been a cartoonist doing political cartoons since 1973. And before that, I was a cartoonist for Playboy magazine. I did the non-girly stuff that made the uh, magazine <laughs> appear to be something more than it was. I thought I'd show you one or two Dry Bones cartoons and then get on to the business at hand. Israel is the only country in the world where we have armed guards to shoot people to prevent them from committing suicide. <laughs> Which is true. And I find that lots of times, if you tell the truth about Israel, people laugh. Uh, this is my main character. His name is Mr. Shuldig. Shuldig in Yiddish means blame. And uh, I created this character because as soon as I got to Israel, I realized that nobody was willing to take the blame for anything. So I would make a character who would get up and say, I did it, I'm to blame. And the very first time I used him, it was a few months after I started the strip, and he was going to come up and find some problem and say, I'm to blame. But instead, he uh, somehow developed a life of his own, and he said he was a problem solver, and we have Kupat Cholim, which is a healthcare, socialized healthcare system, and uh, when you're sick, you go down to the, the health clinic, and they take care of you. The problem is the health clinic opens at 8, and people get there at 7, 7.15, and then when the doors open at 8, everybody rushes in and tries to get a number for the doctor. So Mr. Schuldig said that in order to avoid this, what they should do is give out numbers for the number line. <laughs> Which I thought was mildly amusing until the next week when I got a call from the French Hill branch of Kuprat Cholim saying they had instituted the system <laughs> it was working like a dream. <laughs> so I've been going around telling jokes and stuff, uh, but I'm going to get out of this and get on to the uh, get on to the uh, problem at hand. Okay, so let's take a look at this. As a cartoonist uh, who is offended by people who are pushing uh, a worldwide campaign to destroy me, my family, my friends, and everybody related to me, I get a little upset about anti-Semitism. Uh, but I've been a member of the National Cartoonist Society, an American organization, for at least 20 years. And I was asked by M MSNBC to be on a radio program, which was going to be streamed over the internet, where you have three cartoonists, and they comment on the cartoons of the week. So I'm sitting in Israel, and 
talking into a microphone and two colleagues who are off other places in America and then they're showing us cartoons on the internet and we see one cartoon and we discuss it, we see another one and discuss it and then it gets to the last cartoon and they show a cartoon that is anti-Semitic and the, uh, the moderator says ah, here's this cartoon, it was in the LA Times and there were people who uh, said the cartoonist was being anti-Semitic. And I said, it's an anti-Semitic cartoon. But I wasn't the ADO, I was their buddies. I was a colleague. So instead of defending the cartoon, they all said, what? I said, you, you really think this is anti-Semitic? And I said, absolutely it's anti-Semitic. And they said, why would you say that? And I had to explain to them, the mechanism of anti-Semitism and how this cartoon was functioning. And they didn't argue with me. They just said, interesting, interesting. Which led me to believe that as a profession, we don't have a, a uh, we don't have a definition of what is proper in our profession. We don't have like ethics and standards and all like that. And uh, since getting involved with YISA, I, I think that one of our goals should be that I make contact with other cartoonists and start laying out what is improper. So first, I put together something called poison pens. I've been showing like two or three little things as I'm going around to churches, synagogues, federation, open meetings and stuff. Uh, but generally, I've been entertaining people with jokes and things, and then they'll see a little bit of this. I'll show you the whole thing. A quick look at anti-Semitic techniques in political cartoons. It seems to me that there are two basic ways that anti-Semitism is communicated in cartoons. The first I call moral inversion. Okay? Moral inversion is when you take a victim and you portray the victim as the tormentor and portray the tormentor as the victim. Uh, that naturally leads to Jews as Nazis. Instead of Jews having been the victims of Nazis, Jews in fact are the Nazis. And in which mass movements for world domination portray Jews as world dominators. So if you have a movement that wants the whole world to uh, to worship the god Allah seems to me, if you believe in Allah, that's a, that's a righteous cause. And that you should go around and telling how wonderful Allah is and, and the benefits of the religion. Uh, if instead you seek world domination by intimidation, by killing people, then that's not good. Uh, that's moral inversion. Demonization is the second part of the dual Thing. One is with <clears throat> demonization. Jews are drawn as subhuman demons, and Jewish symbols are presented as demonic symbols. Now, these techniques exist not today. They go back to pre-Christian times. We have early carvings. We've got middle-aged woodcuts. And the same two techniques of moral inversion and demonization are consistent. So I'm going to show you cartoons, but I'm not going to bother to show you the Middle Age stuff. I'm not going to show you a historic thing. We'll deal with what's happening right now. Everything that I'm going to show you is, has been published this year or at most uh, two years ago. So first let's take moral inversion. Okay, Victims are tormentors, tormentors are victims. Uh, you guys all remember this, right? The Achille Lauro. And the thing that you remember about the Achille Laurel is not specifically that they were four members in good standing of Arafat's PLO who took over the boat. What you remember about the Achille Laurel is that they took a guy named Leon Klinghoffer who was in a wheelchair and threw him into the sea. Okay? That's the thing, that's the essence that is remembered by you and by everybody in the Middle East. They threw this wheelchair guy into the sea. Okay, that was in the late 80s. Here's a cartoon from 
from 2008. Okay, uh, Arab News. It is a uh, it is a uh, syndication service. This was printed all over. This is from last year, and what we have is uh, the Jew in the typical disturma kind of thing. Actually, he's better looking than usual, although he's got the big teeth. It's important because Jews devour other people, so this devouring Jew image is important. And this cartoon, he's way behind the times because the new uniform is the Nazi uniform. Mm -hmm. We no longer are showing Jews as being religious. We keep the hat, but... Uh, but anti-Semitic cartoons basically, well, you see what this is, okay? And it resonates. But the people who throw the wheelchair victim into the sea are now the Jews, right? Uh, how many of you know this picture? Okay, most of you don't. Uh, in the year 2000, two Israeli Jews took a wrong turn and drove into the city of Ramallah. They were arrested, they were put into a Palestinian police station, and then people went into the Palestinian police station, took these two guys out of their cell, and physically ripped them apart with the bare hands. And this guy came to the window, I don't know if you can see it, dripping blood from his hands, and he tossed the two Israelis out of the window. We don't know if they were still alive or not. But there was a crowd below. See, here's a hand from one of the people. I cropped it. There's a whole crowd of people cheering down here. And when the two Israelis hit the ground, they were beaten to a pulp with iron bars. Um, how do we have this? We have a whole video of it because there was an Italian news crew. And the Italian news crew videoed the whole thing. Uh, I don't know if you can guess the result of that. The result was that within a week, the Italian government made a formal apology to the Palestinian Authority. The uh, Italian woman newscaster had to go into hiding for a year, and the cameraman left the profession, and I believe left the country. Okay? So that's reality. Okay? Can I, can I for a second? Yeah. Also, it's important to realize that when people are martyred in the jihad, the, the people who are martyred go to heaven. So when they touch the blood, it's the blood of a person that's kind of meaning Allah, who's been martyred, and is in the kingdom of heaven. And this is why they actually take, touch the blood, this is martyred blood. It's very they didn't know sacred that. and holy. Yeah, and just holding it up, not just as a victorious thing, but as showing that the, the blood is with God, hmm. the martyrs with God. Very interesting. So that's 2000. Here is this year from United Arab Emirates. These are the good guys, okay? Look at this, That's, this is clear moral inversion. Everybody knows that picture. Every Israeli, everybody in the Middle East, this is a famous image, and it's turned into this. Uh, now the people with the dripping hands are the, are the Jews. We've got the demonic face, hook nose, whatever. We've got the Jew hat with the swastika. We've got, this is like really rich. And it's from the, uh, from the United Arab Emirates. Next, the idea of mass movements that want to dominate the world, say the Jews want to dominate the world. So here we have sleeping Jew. It says here, Zionist, and he wants to dominate the world. He's got the Jew hat and the machine gun, and he's smiling <coughs> as he dreams of world conquest. Jews drawn as subhuman demons. So we got this cutie. Uh, the inclusion of skulls, massive number of skulls, is also uh, uh, a big signal in the selling of anti-Semitism throughout the Muslim world. Once again, we have this fiendish, non-human, hook-nosed monster. We've got the star, and here Gaza. All he dreams of is death to Gaza. This is from this year. This was really, I put down Arab press because you can't identify what paper 
ran this, it's all over, all over. And once again, you have the demonic Jew eating babies, right? Devouring, the devouring Jew. See, pointy nails, ears. He's got a nice skull cap there. And this is the image of the subhuman, monstrous Jew that eats babies. And, uh, and obviously, uh, we grab little Christian kids or Muslim kids and use their blood to make matzahs. You know? I spent half my life in America and half my life here, so I spent 35 years in America, most in Brooklyn. We had egg matzah, mun matzah. We had onion matzah. Um, we even had chocolate-covered matzah, but there was never any blood matzah. I think that there's an opportunity there with food coloring. We could make red matzah and sell these at high prices to anti-Semites, but look, it's only my idea. Jewish symbols as demonic symbols. Okay. So here we have from the Egyptians, our partners for peace, uh, this year. And so of course you have the Star of David converted into a snake. Once again, the gaping, devouring mouth, only now it's being stopped by a Kalachnikov being frustrated in his desire to devour everything. This is really interesting. This is a standard recycling symbol. But what you have is you recycle Nazism becomes Judaism. Nazism becomes Judaism. Nazism becomes... And it goes around and around. And it's recycling history. Basically saying down through history the Jews are really the Nazis. <coughs> now, I'm a cartoonist, so when I look at a cartoon, I have a serious problem. One is, I never laugh at a cartoon. Because the minute I look at a cartoon, I say, what's he doing? And I see immediately what he's doing. I mean, it's like professional. You don't go back and say, oh, wow, I'm surprised. Because you don't get surprised. You're looking at a mechanism. And so my, my first thought was, why is he doing this? And with cartoons, you are projecting images. And people get images in a subliminal way. People see things and receive things without intellectually perceiving it. So, first thing that hit me that probably doesn't hit you at all is that the empty space is a Jewish star. See, here's one triangle, it goes up, the second goes down. This cartoonist, look, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's a star. And the more you look at this, the more you'll start to see that there's a hidden Jewish star in that. Okay? But that hit you the minute you saw it. You just didn't know that it hit you. You thought this was going on, but this is the thing that's going on. Jews as Nazis. This is from Syria this year, who America now thinks we can talk to. And once again, we have the gaping mouth. We have the Kalachnikov stopping him from eating the little boy. Right? Because we devour children. We've got the Jewish star, and we've got the swastika. But there's something in this cartoon that you're not perceiving. Really interesting. It's this. See these hairs? You see how his, his arm becomes black as it goes into his sleeve? You see up here too? That's because uh, the Islamists teach that Jews are not human, that we are the descendants of pigs and apes. So when any of these guys look at this cartoon, they're not seeing an Israeli soldier. They're seeing a monstrous ape, a non-human. We are non-humans. And this, this is really important to this cartoonist. He's communicating that this is the standard demonic killer ape devouring looking for the blood of the innocent, 
with the typical hook nose, whatever, as accoutrement, but the, but the important thing is down here. Next we have this from Egypt 2001. This is older than I wanted to, but it was such a cute cartoon I thought I'd include it. This Sharon and Hitler buddies. This one is from 2007 in Egypt. This cartoonist is not really very good because he f couldn't figure out a decent way to put the swastikas on. So he just stuck them on the hat. Not a good cartoonist, not a good cartoon. Uh, what he's saying is, we're not killers, we are Nazis. And once again, we see the beast. These are not human beings. These are the subhuman demonic beasts. So killing Jews is not <coughs> killing uh, human beings. It's the same as killing snakes, vipers, subhuman. And a traditional theme of anti-Semitism is that these people are subhuman, okay? So there's plenty of things you could say about Israel, and if you wanted to drive Israel out of the Middle East, I think it would be perfectly reasonable for a cartoonist to come along and say, this whole region worships Allah, and these people here reject the worship of Allah. And we want these Jews out of here. <clears throat> and we're willing to fight war after war to kill them, to drive them out. That seems to me to be a rational, reasonable approach. You could say these Israelis are a bunch of fascists. We could say these Israelis are cruel oppressors. It's not what they say. What they say in these cartoons is that we are not human beings that we are subhuman demons. Here's another cutie. Okay, this was done for the for a big one at the uh, Durban conference. It must be the same guy who can't mm -hmm. figure out how the hell to put a swastika <laughs> on the guy's arm. <laughs> Bad cartoonist. I've been trying to keep bringing only good cartoons. This one is neat, because this is what, from Austria, birthplace of Nazism, and it shows that the way the Nazis treated the Jews is the way the Jews treat the poor little Palestinians. Okay? Classic moral inversion not done by Islamists. This demonization, this, this moral inversion is being done by an Austrian cartoonist. This is beyond the definition of chutzpah. This is by a British cartoonist. Okay? He's saying that Warsaw, 1943, is exactly the same as Tyre, 2006. Okay? What happened in Tyre in 2006 was that the Israeli Air Force targeted uh, some terrorist bases. And that is equated with what happened in 43 when 400,000 Jews were taken from wherever they lived and put into three square miles of Warsaw and walled in. And then 240,000 of them were taken to Treblinka, where they were exterminated. And by the end of 43, there wasn't a Jew alive there. And the British cartoonist says, well, this is the same as this. And people who don't know history, people sitting in England, reading this, they say, wow, the Jews are just doing just what was done to them. Jews are Nazis. Okay? So how can you say this is an anti-Semitic cartoon? Well, I'm just, you know, so I'm exaggerating a little bit. But in fact, if we understand the concept of moral inversion, this is clearly anti-Semitic. This is another one from our Partners for Peace. And once again, we have the pile of skulls. Okay. And we have uh, a hood barak, swastika, and death and destruction reigning on God. There are no uh, 
Kalachnikov's coming back. There's no missiles back. There's no firing. There's simply innocent people, even in tents. I mean, if they did the cities, it wouldn't be as bad. Oh, even people in tents are being killed. Rockets, bombs. Egypt last year. Okay. Uh, Hamas had already taken over. Uh, one of the first things they uh, did when they uh, when they won was uh, to start throwing PLO people out of the windows and rooftops, shooting them in the knees and like that. There was a famous incident. Every now and then, some reporter makes the mistake of being someplace and reporting it. So some European reporter made the mistake of saying that these three PLO guys who had been dragged out to be shot in the street protested, saying, we're not Jews. And they did a cartoon about that because they should have said, we're not Israelis. By saying they're not Jews, it made it look like Hamas was anti-Semitic. Anyway, so here we are. And then look at this one. This shows a really straight Nazi Luger and instead of a swastika a star. And what we have is Baba Yar and all the other uh, incidents in which Jews were herded into pits. And the lucky ones were shot before the bulldozers buried the others alive. And you see their hands are tied, women, blood on the walls, no way out. And they're just sitting victims. The cartoonist, who is an Egyptian, didn't bother to show that this is Egypt, because then he'd have to put an Egyptian soldier standing there, and then it would be a uh, binational operation. So it's simply the Nazi Jew killing people. Is this Moral the same, inversion. The same cartoonist in Egypt or a different person? Excuse me? You've shown more than one Egyptian cartoon. Oh, they're different. They're different all different cartoons. cartoons. Yeah, they're all different cartoons. All different cartoons. Uh, I'm also part of the Israeli Cartoonist Society, and a few years ago we were invited by the uh, Egyptian uh, Cartoonist Society come, to come to Egypt and to meet with them and hang out and stuff. And the day before we got there, uh, there was headlines in the uh, Cairo newspapers saying that uh, Zionist cartoonists had come to the country to subvert our cartoonists, but it wasn't going to work. And what happened was, when we got there, we contacted the people who had invited us. And being Arabs, they weren't going to say, we won't meet with you. One guy's secretary said he got the day wrong. He's in Alexandria today. And another one had a doctor's appointment. And like that. And uh, this is Egypt. This is what's going on. And here we have, once again, this bozo also. We've got the swastika, the monster face, killing the poor little baby. What's happening is the Kalachnikov resistance is beginning to disappear. It's not that we are monsters that are attacking, devouring, and they're trying to defend themselves, they can't even defend themselves. This guy, he's just carrying a flag. And um, this is a cartoonist from uh, Lebanon. His name is Stavos. Uh, I had drinks with him in Malta. Fun-loving guy. He gets enough booze in him and he dances on the tables. And so there we were. And you know, Jews and Nazis. What's what's anti-Semitic about that? Okay, now you ready for the next one? This is Pat Oliphant in the LA Times. When this cartoon came out, well, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, so start thinking. Why is there a wheel, and why does he not have a head? Okay, so when this cartoon came out, and people said, hey, that cartoon is anti-Semitic. He said, you're just right-wing supporters of Israel. This is called hyperbole. <coughs> and I call this anti-Semitism because it meets 
all the qualifications. First of all, it has the demonization of the religious symbol. Second of all, it has the devouring mouth going after babies, in this case, poor Gaza lady holding little baby, no fighting back, no Kalachnikov. And then we've got uh, Jews as Nazis. And we've got the, uh, the boots, goose-stepping the law. And because Pat Oliphant is a really great cartoonist, see, it's a sword. But actually, your mind is reading it as a Sig Heil salute. See, if he was after this lady, this sword would be pointed down, and then you wouldn't read it as Sig Heil. This is a goose-stepping Nazi doing Sig Heil. Why is there no head? There's no head because you've seen all the monstrous subhuman hook nose images. For him to be honest, he would have had to have put this demon head on. And if he put the demon head on, people would say, wait a minute, you're an anti-Semite. So he just leaves the head off. No explanation. Fine, it works. Okay. Now, why the wheel? The wheel is the most important part of this cartoon. Okay. Why? Because this wheel establishes a feeling of weight. This star is rolling on the ground, she's walking on the ground, he's marching on the ground. Okay? If we erase this wheel, and we erase these others, you know what we have? We have the Jewish star with one bar and another bar. This is an Israeli flag. You see it now? When you first looked at that cartoon, the Israeli flag got into your mind. Pat knows what he's doing. What he did was he sat down and he drew one bar, two bars, and a star. And then he said, okay, what am I going to do with this flag? So first of all, the devouring Jew. The devouring, remember we saw the Star of David turning into a snake with the, the mouth, okay? So we have the devouring Jew symbol, the innocent victim. Then he thought, okay, we'll add the whole idea of Jews or Nazis. So he adds that to it, and it's pretty good, and he's looking at it. I know just how he did it, but this is the way I would do it. And he comes and he says, you know, it still looks like a star still looks like a flag. People are going to see what this is. And then, moment of genius, he puts in the wheel, and nobody sees the flag. But that flag is getting into your mind. And the more you look at this, the more obvious it becomes to you that this is an Israeli flag. When you saw it, it got straight into your mind, without your intellect catching it. The cartoonists are able to get under the radar, right? Get under your intelligence, and that way he's able to communicate a really heavy anti-Semitic message, which is disguised as simply criticism of Israel. Okay? Next. Pat Oliphant is the most widely syndicated political cartoonist in the world, described by the New York Times as the most influential cartoonist now working. So this is not some cartoonist. This is America's best political cartoonist. This cartoon appeared in more newspapers and more venues than anybody else's. This is Pat Oliphant. So it raises a really interesting question, in my mind at least. We are facing a movement that is incredibly anti-Semitic. And not only is it anti-Semitic, it is wildly homophobic. When Ahmadinejad spoke at uh, Columbia, he said, in Iran we don't have homosexuals. And the audience laughed, you know. 
Well, they don't have homosexuals, because if you're homosexual, they kill you. Homosexuals are not allowed to live in Iran. But that gap of understanding between college kids and the reality of what they're being told was beyond them to grasp. There are no homosexuals. The only homosexuals in Iran are dead homosexuals, or people who are doing their best to disguise it. And so you, you begin to wonder if, it, if a movement <coughs> is so wildly homophobic, how come there is no gay or lesbian organization standing up and yelling? You would think that would be, you know? And then you say, it's wildly <coughs> anti-female. You'd think that some women's organizations might be upset about female genital mutilation, the idea that women should walk around in body bags, or the idea that a 40-year-old woman can't go anyplace without a male, even if it's a nine-year-old boy, leading her around. The idea of women as chattel, the whole thing. Not a single woman's organization standing up and taking the cause. I figure the reason for this is that as soon as there is a serious genocidal worldwide mass movement targeting Jews, everybody else stands back and says, well, let's see what the Jews do and let's hope they don't overreact. You've got an Israeli state of, of six million people, of which 20% are Christians, Muslims, Druzim, 80% are Jews, but that's enough. It's a Jewish state. And you have Iran, massive country. Iran says, we're going to wipe you off the map, and we're going to go build atomic bombs. So the world's question is, what will Israel do? Right? There's no question as to what the world will do, because once it's anti-Semitism, question is what will the Jews do and everybody backs off so there's no women's groups, there's no gay and lesbian, nobody. We've got to see what the Jews are going to do and we hope that they don't overreact. See? So that is the situation we face today and it's not a unique situation. This is what happened in the 30s and most people watched the anti-Semitism FDR was president. There was a massive wave of anti-Semitism all through Europe. That was of no interest to anybody. You know. So the question is, what happened? Last time this happened, we know that 6 million Jews died, but so did 55 million non-Jews, including 20 million Germans died because they said, oh, those Jews, they're dirty, and you know what, they are snakes, they are subhuman. And that was, a, that was a free ticket. That was the ability to not have opposition from everybody who should have opposed it. Okay? So, that should make you either, I say depressed, but people have corrected me and say it should make you angry. Well, uh, I'm now going to get into, I don't know how much time we have, so just, we're okay? We're okay? Yeah. Uh, you know me, I'll just Another 30, pick. 30 minutes in total. Okay. Uh, this is, this is, uh, sure. some? Yeah, I'm sorry, you did have some time for questions. Questions, questions, discussion, yeah, but I want to show you this, because this will, this will raise some more questions. <coughs> After dealing with this, and dealing with the thing when you say Pat Oliphant's cartoon, is anti-Semitic, suddenly we discover that there is delegitimization even of the term anti-Semitism. If I say that's anti-Semitic, nobody looks at that, they look at me and say, oh, you're saying it's anti-Semitic, that means you must be right-wing. Okay, so the Yale Institute, the Yale Initiative, is considered by some people, oh, it must be an apologist for fascist Israelis, rather than, it's about anti-Semitism, dummy. But the minute you say anti-Semitism, 
you are delegitimized. Okay? So, first, anti Semitism is just a buzzword used by right wing Jewish extremists to defame anyone who dares criticize the Jewish state. Here's a cartoon. This would, don't bother to read it, I'm going to cut it apart for you. This is a full page cartoon using a Marvel Comics super character called the Incredible Hulk. So I've cut it apart for you. This is the tragic tale of a liberal, socially conscious Jew. And he turns into a raving maniac. Okay. The question is, how did this happen? Well, he's watching television, and the newscaster makes a remark that could possibly be construed as mildly cartoons can yell, critical of Israel, right? And this poor, decent human being goes, no, my head, throbbing, ah! And he turns from a normal human being into a monster. Hulk destroyed television anti-Semites. See? This monster, it was a remark that was mildly critical, and it sets him off onto some attack. He's, he's, he's using that too. And he's launching an email <laughs> campaign and then he's got all this political stuff. He starts hooking up with with uh, all the bad guys. He's against homosexuals. He's against abortions, Mexicans. He's like going totally berserk out of his mind. He finally hooks up with Christian evangelicals. Oh my God. And now suddenly the veil gets lifted. Oh, He's, oh my God, I can think again. And he can now, he dreams of a time when the madness will end. And he can return to a normal life without the beast that was in him. The beast that was in him was, of course, a response to something and saying, that's anti-Semitic. That was the beast. That's a full cartoon. I've shown you every box. Okay? Here's another cutie. This is phone sex of the... Uh, rich and famous, uh, Mel Gibson revealed his anti-Semitism. The ADL condemned him. So this cartoon shows the two of them masturbating on the phone. And uh, they enjoy each other. There's, there's no anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is just something that, that the ADL and A. Fox would say in order to remain rich. Sure. And so he says, we start the wars, we control the banks, we created AIDS, well, Darfur is our fault, blah, 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 blah. He doesn't even put the anti-Semitism into the mouth of Gibson. It's, Tell me, baby, oh, oh, we're going to get you, you filthy Jew. Right? Another cartoon. Here, a guy he says, what well, warms my heart, no amount of racketeering, wire fraud, or tax evasion According to the cartoonists, these are Jewish crimes, right? These are money crimes. None of it gives them the same pleasure as alerting people to the dangers of anti-Semitism. Alerting people to anti-Semitism is even more fun than tax evasion or wire fraud, according to this cartoonist. The, these are all in American papers, American cartoonists? Better than that. Who hate them? Better than that. <laughs> All of the preceding cartoons were drawn by a guy named Eli Valley. Eli Valley is on the staff of the Steinhardt Foundation for Jewish Life, where he is a foundation writer and editor. He's the author of the great, author of the great Jewish cities of Central and Eastern Europe. His cartoons appear in the Jewish Forward, various Jewish websites, and all over the internet. That Hulk cartoon was published full page in the Jewish folder. Okay, I don't know if I have something here or how I did. I just thought at this point, even though this topic was denigrating uh, the use of the term anti-Semitism, uh, I thought I'd show you some other cartoons by, <coughs> by this uh, uh, senior foundation writer at the Steinhardt Foundation for Jewish Life. Could you give us some insight, I'm sorry, as to why the Jewish Forward might decide to publish that full page? Well, that's a really interesting question. Well, why Steinhardt? Why is Steinhardt? Okay. 
So if I said to you, this guy, this cartoonist name, name is Schmidt, and he was publishing in Christ for the Nations, mm -hmm. you wouldn't ask me that question. You would say, anti-Semites. But you know what? He's a Jew, and it's a Jewish newspaper. So your question is, well, why is he doing this? Why? You can't say to yourself, these are anti-Semites selling anti-Semitism. Because he's a Jew. Therefore, there's got to be something I'm not grasping here. Okay? We'll get on a little more with that if we still have some time. Or what we want to get to. Okay. Here's a cartoon of his. Real classic. Arafat on the cross being injected with AIDS, okay, by the Jew. That was during the time when, when people were, the rumor went around that Arafat had died of AIDS. I did a cartoon at the time saying he did not die of AIDS. He died of a heart attack when they told him he had AIDS. <laughs> I'm gonna, I wasn't going to put this up, and I said there was stuff I didn't want to show, and Charles said, show him, show him, whatever. Well, I guess he didn't expect this. This cartoon is done by this foundation, senior foundation writer of a Jewish organization in New York. Wow. Right, right. You want to see this stuff? Just get online. Go to Julicious. It's probably on J Street by now. It's uh, in the forward. It's all over. Uh, as a result of that, I said, we have to do something because not only, not only can cartoons sell anti-Semitism, but maybe they could fight anti-Semitism. Maybe they could fight these Jewish defamers of Israel specifically. Okay. So when I give a speech, what I do is I always have notebooks with me. Right. I got hundreds of these notebooks, and what I do is when I'm going to give a speech, I draw a picture of me and I draw what I'm saying. Right, so my notebooks fill up with stuff, and then I'm about to come over, and I say to my wife, wow, I've got a big job now to, like, to take this stuff and turn it into cartoons. She said, you're talking to intelligent people. You've got sketches. Scan the sketches. Show them the sketches. So here's notes from... She's always right. It's a really annoying thing. So, so I said, these are the cuckoos in our nest. And people said, oh, ha, 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 cuckoos because most people don't know what cuckoos are. So, the cuckoo's in our nest. In the world of cartoons, a cuckoo is a silly mechanical bird that hops out of the clock. In the real world, however, the cuckoo is something different. Hey, that's me talking here. <laughs> I'm sorry I got carried away. So, it's, so, a real cuckoo is something very sinister. This is going to be to answer your question as to why they do this. The question is, how could it be that Jews are spouting this stuff? And the answer is that that monster that seeks to destroy the Jewish people down through one wave after another wave after another wave of uh, genocidal uh, anti-Semitism has now found a way to speak through the mouths of Jews. So I start with a question about the Ten Commandments, a question asked by Moses. This question was asked by me, actually. It says, honor thy father and mother. Why is there nothing about children? I asked a very famous rabbi, Reb Noach Weinberg, who started Eshat Torah. I said, how come it doesn't say, like, love your children? And he said, the reason is because everybody, no matter how good their parents are, they have some grudge. You know, they didn't let me go to France in my senior year. <laughs> she never bought me those ballet slippers I was dying for. I appeared in the play... And she sold me a dress. She didn't buy me a costume. Everybody has some grudge against their parents. But your kids, no matter how crappy they are, it's a kid. So, how does that relate to cuckoos? Here is a mama bird. She's sitting on a nest. Okay, she's hatching her eggs, gets hungry, wants to get a worm, pick up some more twigs, and so she goes off. What happens? While she's gone, a cuckoo, which is a type of bird, comes and lays an egg in her nest. Interestingly, the cuckoo bird has the shortest gestation period of any other bird. So the egg is in the nest, boom, first chick that hacks, 
hatches out is a cuckoo. The next thing that happens is the cuckoo chick kills all the other birds, pokes their eyes out, pushes them out of the nest, and remains the only bird. And so there's the mama bird saying, well, this is my baby, right? Eli Valley, he's a Jew. Jewish, there has to be a reason that he's saying these things, right? Zionism is apartheid, boycott Israel, ban Israeli professors. So I decided for a response. And what my response was to come up with a bird watcher's guide to the Jewish defamers of Israel. Okay, having grown up in America, in Brooklyn, I thought of baseball cards. So on one side we'll have the cuckoo, and in the other, explain. Cuckoo's nest is placed to hatch in the nest of other birds, blah, blah, blah. Cuckoo's are the Jewish defamers. And then I thought, you know, it's not just that they appear looking as cuckoos, they appear dressed in different ways. So here's the anti-Israeli, Israeli professor who says, boycott me, guy from uh, uh, Ben Gurion University, writes an article in, in the LA Times saying, you, you've got to stop these Israeli professors. Uh, next we have the see no evil news hawk. He's off here uh, blinding himself to what Israel is facing. I said, well, you know the guy's a Jew, there's got to be something. And then we have the one-sided wallpecker. This guy is coming down, he wears a, an Arab kafia, and his, uh, his goal is to not let uh, Jews put up uh, defensive walls or fences. This is a seasoned TV turkey. After years of anti-Israel news reports, he can now discuss how Israel is an apartheid state, uh, which is really interesting. It's like calling Jews an apartheid state is as morally inverse as the Nazi business. Of course, if you look at the movement to divest or to boycott South Africa to fight apartheid, Jews were constantly in the lead, and those South African whites who fought apartheid, which largely Jews, and therefore moral aversion. Here we got the black-coated nest fowler. You've seen these guys, they appear, right? And then I said, this is an idea that really tickles my fancy. Well, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to Topps Chewing Gum and try to tell them that instead of putting in baseball players, they should put in anti-Semitic Jews along with the bubble gum? This is not going to work. So what am I going to do? So I came up with an idea. The idea is to have a website called jdefamers.com, and I hope to do this with the ZOA maybe, and have a really aggressive attack on this phenomenon. Once again, the problem is when I explain to a friend, jdefamers.com, and it's going to be all about anti-Semitic Jews, he said, oh, they're going to be able to find dates with each other. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, are there any questions? I was the chairperson of the African National Congress Solidarity Committee of Canada and of the UK, and the ANC invited me to South Africa to do work. And I come from this sort of human rights tradition, 
come, growing up in Canada, living in Europe, and, become, and, and being a part of this tradition, and coming to the United States, the American political context, for better or for worse, is much more conservative and right-wing than European, Canadian, and I'd say even Israeli political context. And yet, when you speak about anti-Semitism, as you said, I am often lumped as a neocon, as right-wing, uh, and worse. Um, actually, a colleague recently uh, wrote me an email saying that Jews like me, who constantly uh, bang the drums of war, are, are bringing shame on the Jewish community in the United States. Um, and this type of rhetoric. And it's amazing that when you speak about a reactionary social movement, I'm not speaking about Muslims, I'm not speaking about Islam, but radical political Islamicism, which is genocidal in its anti-Semitism. And I'm using the word deliberately. It's genocidal in its anti-Semitism. And as Yaakov shows, what we've shown in our seminars, they're upfront, they're honest, they're clear, they're consistent. They make no bones about it. It's we in the West who have a problem looking at this issue. They're not only genocidal in their anti-Semitism, as Yaakov said, they're homophobic, and they kill and punish gay people. They subjugate women. Women are literally, in a legal sense, worth 50% uh, legally of that of a man. As Yaakov said, in some societies like Iran, and now in Gaza increasingly, women cannot go out of the house by themselves. They have to be accompanied by uh, their husbands. And this sort of reactionary movement, <coughs> of course, they're anti-democratic. They're anti, fundamentally anti-democratic in the sense that they don't want people to be equal under the law. If Jews are to survive, they can be dimmy, they can be second-class citizens, but they cannot be equal citizens, women, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my question to you, traveling in the, in the United States, and I think that as Elie Wiesel has spoken at Yale, and has told me personally, as Natan Sharansky has told me personally, is that why do you feel? I think Israel, in the last uh, eight to 10 years, there's been a sea change. They realize what they're up against. They realize, as Benny Morris says, and I think he uses the word deliberately and, and, and well, the barbarians are at the door. Because these are barbarians at the door, literally. Why in the United States? Why do you think in the academy? Why in the leadership of the Jewish community? Like very much in the 1930s, I may add, when, sorry, when the Jews, when the Jewish leadership was afraid of accepting refugees from Europe who spoke Yiddish and were primitive and not as uh, cosmopolitan as the New York Jews they were afraid that bringing refugees from Europe would cause anti-Semitism. Why is there a silence in your opinion? And why is there a significant, I think it's the beginning of a significant distancing from Israel with all its contradictions and problems, this is the only democracy in the Middle East. Why is there this, there's this distancing? Uh, Professor Benatar is here, he wrote a very important play on this very similar issue. What, in your mind, now that you've come here from Israel, what do you think is going on? I disagree with one thing you said. Only one? No, no, no. <laughs> one thing, you were right on everything, one thing you're wrong about. And that is saying that Jews were silent during the Nazi rise and they're being silent today. No, no. And distancing themselves. I think there was a there was among the Jewish leadership in the 1930s there was fear that shtetl Jews would immigrate to the United States would cause them and therefore they were sorry. Yeah. Okay. I don't believe that American Jews are being silent. I think a good part of American Jewry is getting on to the side of the anti-Semites. I think if American Jews would just shut up and do nothing the way they did in the 30s, it would be better than having Jews condemn Israel as if Israel was the source of the anti-Semitism rather than the second third of the Jewish people being targeted. One set of six million was destroyed while Americans kept mum. Another set of six million is being threatened while a good part of American Jewry is saying they kill children. They do all this bad stuff. I would, you know, it has become so bad, so bad, there's stuff going on that I'm sure you don't know about. A, a woman wrote her doctoral thesis 
at Hebrew University, meaning that she worked with a professor, and when she got her doctorate, her thesis won a prize at Hebrew University. Her thesis was and is that Israelis are provably racist because Israeli soldiers do not rape Palestinian women. <laughs> no joke. No joke. A woman was awarded a doctorate. Her professor helped her to build this. And after she produced it, they won a prize because Israeli soldiers don't rape Palestinian women. That is the insanity that we're dealing with. And to look for a rational cause for that. Why, why would Hebrew University do that? Why would the, the Jewish forward print that? We are dealing in insane times. And we are dealing when the only way you understand what's going on in the world is through the media. And the media lies to you. And when it thinks it's telling the truth, it's got it wrong. So I think we can't explain it. We just have to figure out how to fight it. Yeah? Yeah. I, I really perked up, uh, my ears perked up when, when you mentioned the Durban um, Conference 2001. Mm -hmm. You know that the topic of that conference was racism. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I happen to, I lived in South Africa for about 10 years. And um, I'm a Quaker. Um, and so the Quaker Peace Center um, in, in Cape Town sends a delegation to that conference. And I was absolutely horrified. I said, how can you, it was, it was already very clear what, this, what would be going on at the conference. That, they didn't surprise anybody. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was very clear that this would be turned into a, a, an Arab or, or Muslim PLO hate Part of our problem right now that we all exhibit is we don't have a name for the enemy. We mm -hmm. used to be able to say we were fighting the Nazis or the Axis powers. We don't know if we're fighting Islamo-fascists, who are fighting Islamic fundamentalists, who are fighting... We, you can't yeah. even focus on whether it's Arabs or Muslims. It's like this yeah. force. But it's, uh, you know, I, I absolutely know what you mean about, about complete insanity, about, about utterly irrational behavior. We Quakers are um, fundamentally nonviolent. That's our, that's our only, that's our basic rule. Um, and so we naturally would be very conscientious about avoiding hate speech, about avoiding racism. And you know, when I when I said this in, in my meeting, and I've been an officer, um, I've been an elder in meetings. Um, um, so um, you know, when I said, "How can we do this? We can't participate in this. We can't send a a, a delegation there. We are Quakers." Um, didn't care. You know, there, there's some kind of just um, like some kind of mind rate that 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 the um, the Arab world is able to you know shoot into liberal Westerners that says um, when we do it, it's not murder, it's not hatred, it's not incitement to violence. Excuse me, Iranians are not Arabs. Oh, sorry, it's way sorry. beyond, it's way beyond Okay, Muslim, I could thing. say Muslim world, or radical Muslim world. We don't have the word. We don't, we don't really have the word. We don't have the word. Yeah, yeah. And you can't deal with something unless you can name it. So constantly, we're, are we talking about Muslims? Are we talking about extremist Muslims? Are we talking about fundamentalists? Are we talking about Arabs? Yeah. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. And why Quakers would take part in that is as puzzling a question as why would Jews take part in that? Yeah, um, it's, um, you know, Qu uh, Quakers and, and Jews have been allies in a lot of social right. reform. I think the answer is that we can't figure that out. What we have to figure out is what do we do? And I think the first step in doing something is to understand something. And in order to understand something, you have to examine something. And the initiative for the interdisciplinary study of anti-Semitism mm -hmm is the first step. And the only thing really terrible about it is that Yusuf is the only such is the only such thing. There should be 
There should be one at Harvard, there should be one at Yale, there should be one at Oxford. There, this should be a standard thing that Western universities examine. And this room, this organization is the only one. We're getting the opposite. Um, Harvard, Georgetown, and now Yale is up for one. Um, a, a massively funded institution um, uh, set up by um, Saudi Royal House for Christian Muslim reconciliation, Jews shoved to the side. This is, it's basically a propaganda operation. Um, this one from the Arab world, um, you know, to tightly control academic discourse concerning, right. um, concerning Muslim politics. Obviously. You want to get some more questions or some more I discussion? Want, I just want to, uh, but only you said that we talking because I, I was recently uh, giving a talk at Dickinson College and, um, I'm going to interrupt. Professor Benatar wrote a very interesting, good, and successful play on the uh, Jewish paper, uh, which has been picked up by various theater companies and now in a very prestigious mm -hmm. one in uh, Israel. Um, anyway, so I was, uh, I was in Dickinson um, <coughs> College and the, and the Yale, uh, basically, Yale, so the director of the Jewish house there uh, told me. Uh, uh, he said, you know, there's this uh, guy named Barry Rubin that, that I was asked if I would even have uh, come to the students. Um, and there's no way I'm going to bring this right to cook um, to the students at the uh, I think you only have to probably invite me because of my leftist credential. But otherwise, it was, uh, it, it was a, you know, so what you're describing, the kind of, it, it's just so, I mean, I'm looking at this and I hear what you describe, and it's just like, it's so fascinating, and uh, I must say that I'm personally very alarmed, but I don't know what to do about it. Well, we're facing a malaise which is either supernatural or, I mean, as, as thinking people, we cannot explain what's happening. There's no way to explain this, right? All there is, is to set up some way to examine this phenomenon. And thanks to Charles, that's what we're doing. I mean, otherwise, I would not have been sitting and saying, well, gee, how does it work? What are the rules? How can I, how can I be able to say to another cartoonist, this is the border, and when you get into that border, you are now committing hate crimes, you are now demonizing, moral, unless we have names for this. And it's not a question of uh, Jews and the rest of the world. I was just speaking at a at a non-denominational church in Simi Valley. And those people get it, you know? And those of us who are uninfected, you know, Ionesco had a play called Rhinoceros. And in that play, there's a little town, and one by one, people are turning into rhinoceroses, right? And eventually, everybody turns into a rhinoceros, and the whole town is filled with rhinoceroses running around. And suddenly the last man comes up to the, to the stage and says, what do you do when everybody has turned into rhinoceroses? Do you just go along with it, or do you try on your own to remain a human being? And UNESCO wrote it about the Nazis. I had the privilege of seeing it on, on Broadway. Uh, we're facing it again. It's here again. I like to tell a joke about a guy who goes to a doctor, and he says, doctor, something's wrong with me. And the doctor says, well, what do you have? He says, I see black and red spots in front of my eyes. The doctor says, what else? He says, I hear a ringing in my ears. It goes up and down, up and down. And I also have this bizarre rash on both of my elbows. The doctor says, have you had this before? He says, yes. The doctor says, well, you got it again. <laughs> so, you know, we had to face this in the Middle Ages, we had to face this with the Nazis, and guys, i got to tell you, we got it again. And how to cure this illness, and whether we remain the last human beings as the rest of the West turns into rhinoceros, I don't know, but that's where we are. We have like three more minutes, and then there's apparently another class coming in. Any other questions or comments? So my question is, 
do people find what I presented as depressing or angering? Both. Yes. Yes. Both. Both. The answer is Both. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. No time for you. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. And uh, tomorrow, Barry Rubin will be here at 4.15 in the LC building. We'll say hello to him, a little friend.